as Obi set out into the forest, the same voice that had spoken to his mother before he was born whispered to him, My son, do not be afraid, for I am with you. I have been with you even before your mother conceived you. Heed my words, for if thou treadest upon this path, thou shalt encounter great danger. Obi paused, his heart pounding with uncertainty. He knew not whether to trust the voice, but deep within him he felt a stirring of faith, a belief that this voice held wisdom beyond his comprehension. Take this leaf, the voice continued, and rub it upon thy face. Then follow the path to thy right. There thou shalt face a fearsome lion, but fear not, for I shall be by thy side. Thou shalt emerge victorious, my son, for I am ever with thee. With trembling hands, Obi reached out and plucked the leaf from the ground. He rubbed it gently against his cheeks, feeling a strange warmth spreading through his veins. As he turned to follow the path indicated by the voice, a surge of determination coursed through him. He knew not what lay ahead, but he trusted in the guiding hand of destiny. The forest seemed to come alive around him as he pressed onward. The rustle of leaves and the chirping of birds forming a symphony of nature's song. At last, Obi reached a clearing bathed in golden sunlight, where a majestic lion stood poised, its mane rippling in the breeze. Its fierce gaze locked with Obi's, and he felt a shiver of fear run down his spine. But then he remembered the words of the voice. Do not be afraid, for I am with thee. Drawing upon the courage within him, Obi stepped forward to face the lion, his heart pounding. The battle that ensued was fierce and relentless. Obi fought with all his strength, his limbs moving with a grace and agility he never knew he possessed. The lion roared with fury, its claws slashing through the air with deadly precision. Yet, with each blow exchanged, Obi felt the presence of the voice guiding him, lending him strength and resolve. He fought not just for himself, but for his village, for his family, for all those who have lost their lives. And then, in a final decisive moment, Obi delivered a powerful blow that sent the lion reeling. With a mighty roar, the beast collapsed to the ground, defeated at last. As Obi stood victorious amidst the echoes of his triumph, he felt a profound sense of gratitude wash over him. As morning dawned, the news of Obi's journey to defeat the dangerous lion spread like wildfire throughout the village. Fear gripped the hearts of the villagers, including Obi's parents, as they anxiously waited at the path leading to the forest, praying for his safe return. To their astonishment and relief, Obi emerged from the forest, walking majestically, his head held high. The villagers erupted into cheers and applause, overjoyed to see their hero return unharmed. Obi's parents rushed forward, tears of relief streaming down their faces as they embraced their brave son. However, amidst the jubilation, one figure stood apart, Chuka, Obi's twin brother. While he outwardly pretended to share in the happiness of Obi's safe return, a storm raged within him. He had harboured deep-seated resentment towards his brother for years, and seeing Obi emerge victorious only fueled his anger further. As the villagers celebrated Obi's triumph, Chuka's heart boiled with jealousy and bitterness. Not only had Obi survived the perilous journey, but he was also being praised and honoured by the villagers. And to make matters worse, Obi was now set to become second in command to the king, a position that Chuka had always coveted. With a heavy heart burdened by envy and hatred, Chuka watched as Obi was cheered to the king's palace by the jubilant villagers. Soon, the entire village had gathered at the palace, eager to catch a glimpse of their hero and celebrate his bravery. As Obi danced, ate and drank with the villagers at the king's palace, celebrating his victory, he was surrounded by joy and laughter. The air was filled with the sound of drums and cheerful voices as everyone rejoiced in his bravery. Obi's heart swelled with pride 
as he looked around at the smiling faces of his friends and neighbours, grateful for their support. Little did he know, amidst the festivities, his twin brother Chuka lurked in the shadows, his heart heavy with envy and resentment. While outwardly pretending to join in the celebration, Chuka's eyes burned with jealousy as he watched Obi being showered with praise and admiration. The day after the celebration, the king summoned Obi and presented him with a choice, to marry one of his five daughters. To everyone's surprise, Obi chose the youngest daughter. This decision stirred up jealousy, especially in the eldest daughter, who had always harboured feelings for Obi. She admired his strength, bravery and handsome looks, and had secretly hoped to marry him. Now, seeing him choose her younger sister filled her heart with envy and resentment. Chuka, who was also present at the king's palace, suddenly stood up and stormed out, his face contorted with anger. The sudden departure surprised everyone, but Obi quickly stepped in to defuse the tension. He explained to the puzzled onlookers that Chuka was feeling unwell and had to leave because of a sudden stomachache. The villagers nodded understandingly, accepting Obi's explanation without question. With the situation calmed, the king proceeded with his plans. He fixed a date for Obi's coronation, which would also serve as his wedding day to the princess. Excitement rippled through the crowd as the announcement was made, and the villagers eagerly began making preparations for the grand event. Obi, though grateful for the king's generosity and eager to begin his new life as both a prince and a husband, couldn't shake off a nagging feeling of unease. He couldn't help but wonder what had caused Chuka's sudden outburst and whether his twin brother was truly unwell or if there was something more troubling him. Despite these concerns, Obi remained determined to focus on the joyous occasion ahead. When Obi returned home, he sought out Chuka to confront him about his sudden departure from the king's palace. Why did you leave like that? Obi asked, puzzled by his brother's behaviour. Chuka's eyes flashed with anger as he replied, How dare you choose my princess? Obi was surprised. Your princess? What do you mean? He asked, genuinely confused. Don't you understand? Chuka snapped. I have always loved Princess Chika. I've admired her for so long, praying that one day we would marry. Obi was stunned. But you've never told me about this before, he said, feeling hurt by his brother's secrecy. Must I tell you everything about me? Chuka retorted. Besides, you're my younger brother. You're too small to understand. You have to stay away from Princess Chika, or else... Or else what? Obi demanded, his temper rising. But before he could get an answer, Chuka stormed out angrily, slamming the door behind him. Confused and upset, Obi turned to his parents for guidance. He explained everything that had transpired at the king's palace, including Chuka's unexpected confession. Amandi and Rafatu were just as surprised as Obi. Chuka had never mentioned his feelings for Princess Chika before. Concerned, they decided to talk to Chuka and hear his side of the story. After listening to his explanation, Amandi stood up, facing his sons with a stern expression. My beloved children, there is nothing here, he began. Chuka has never spoken of marrying the princess, so I see no issue. Chuka interjected, his voice filled with determination. Don't say that, father. Even if I haven't spoken of my feelings, it doesn't mean Obi should marry her. I won't allow it. Obi can't always be victorious. He can't shine in everything. Now he's going to be second in command, and of all the other princesses, he chooses mine. I won't let that happen. One of us must step aside, or I'll make sure of it. His words hung heavy in the air filled with a sense of foreboding. Obi and his parents exchanged worried glances, realising that the situation was far more complicated than they had initially thought. The following day, Obi was surprised to find Chuka in his room. 
Chuka expressed his forgiveness and gave his blessing for Obi to marry the princess. Overjoyed, Obi thanked his brother warmly for his understanding. Chuka then suggested they go hunting together to celebrate. Despite feeling tired, Obi agreed, not wanting to disappoint his brother, especially after Chuka's apology. They set out for the bush, intending to hunt and prepare a delicious meal. As they journeyed, they encountered the king's eldest daughter, who had come to apologize to Obi for her behavior at the palace. Obi accepted her apology graciously, understanding the pain she felt. Before parting ways, she insisted on joining them for the hunt, much to the surprise of Obi and Chuka. However, Obi hesitated, explaining that women in their village didn't participate in hunting, and it would anger the king if he found out. But the princess was determined to learn, and eventually they relented, agreeing to let her come along. As they ventured deeper into the forest, they were suddenly ambushed by twenty mysterious men. Before Obi could react, they seized him and started dragging him. While the strangers were dragging Obi away, Chuka and the princess watched and started laughing. That's good for you. I told you I would deal with you. You think you can triumph over me? Chuka sneered. I planned this with the princess. You deserve to be gone and forgotten and never returned. Please, Chuka, don't do this to me. Remember, I am your only brother. Please have mercy on me. Don't let them take me away. Obi pleaded desperately, but Chuka didn't listen. He turned his back and left with the princess without looking back. Though Obi was blessed with powers, the strangers had also came prepared for him. He tried his best to fight back, but he couldn't. They had used charms to take away his power. So, defeated, Obi gave in, and they took him away. When Chuka arrived home, his parents were already worried because neither he nor Obi were home when they left for hunting. They asked Chuka where his brother was, and he lied, saying that Obi had also left after their parents had gone out, and he hadn't seen him since. Amandi and Rafatu became even more worried when their son has not returned, and it was already dark. They anxiously waited, hoping to catch a glimpse of Obi's familiar figure emerging from the forest. However, as the night wore on and Obi still didn't appear, their concern grew into panic. Soon, everyone in the village was aware that Obi, their hero, was missing. The youth hunters went to the forest in search of him, fearing he had been attacked by an animal. They searched the forest tirelessly, throughout the whole week, but Obi was nowhere to be found. The villagers even expanded their search to the neighbouring village, hoping to find some clue about Obi's whereabouts, but their efforts were in vain. As the days passed without any sign of Obi, the village was filled with a sense of sorrow and despair. They prayed for his safe return, but with each passing day, their hopes was lost. As the day of the coronation approached, and there was still no sign of Obi, the king grew increasingly concerned. He declared that if Obi did not return within two days, Chuka would replace him as the second in command. Furthermore, Chuka would also have the opportunity to marry any of the princesses. When Chuka heard the king's declaration, he couldn't contain his joy. This was what he had longed for all along, the chance to take his brother's place and fulfill his own ambitions. Two days passed since the king's declaration, and there was still no sign of Obi. Despite consulting the village priest and conducting thorough searches, Obi remained missing. With heavy hearts, the king and villagers accepted the grim reality. The king proceeded to fulfill his decree, appointing Chuka as the second in command. Chuka's chest swelled with pride as he stepped into his new role, eager to wield the power and influence he had long coveted. As for choosing a wife, Chuka wasted no time in selecting his bride. He chose Princess Amaka, the eldest daughter, the same one who had been with him the day Obi was taken away by the strangers. Meanwhile, 
Obi found himself in a distant kingdom called Udo, sold to King Abina by the strangers who had abducted him. In Udo, Obi's fate took a dark turn. He was to serve King Obina for ten long years before being sold off to another king, destined to repeat the cycle. Life in Udo was harsh and unforgiving. Obi was subjected to cruel treatment, forced to work tirelessly on the king's farm without adequate food or rest. His only solace was a meagre meal provided once a day. To make matters worse, Obi was deprived of sleep, forced to stand guard at the king's palace alone throughout the night. As the days turned into weeks and the weeks into months, Obi's spirit began to wither under the weight of his suffering. The relentless abuse and loneliness gnawed at him, leaving him longing for escape. There were moments when he wished he had never survived the ambush, for the torment of his existence seemed unbearable. As Obi worked hard in the king's garden under the hot sun, he started feeling very hungry because he hadn't eaten for a long time. A maid who was watching him noticed how tired and hungry he looked. She felt sorry for him and decided to help. Quietly, she gave Obi some food she had taken from the palace kitchen. Here, she whispered, giving him the food. I see you haven't eaten for a while. You must be really hungry. Obi was very thankful for the food and smiled at the maid. Even though she could get in trouble for giving him food, she couldn't stand seeing him hungry. She hoped her kindness would help him feel better. However, King Obina caught sight of Obi eating and flew into a rage. Furious that his orders had been disobeyed, he ordered Obi to be immediately locked away in the palace prison. The maid, who had shown compassion to Obi, was fired as punishment for her disobedience to the king's commands. After the palace maid was sent out of the palace, never to return, King Obina ordered the guards to lock Obi up in the palace cell, never to be served food for three days. One night, as Obi was sleeping, a voice reached out to him, saying, Obi, my son, thou shalt not be afraid, for I have been with you even before you were born. Obi opened his eyes, scared, trying to know where the voice was coming from. Who are you and what do you want from me? he asked. I am your protector, and I have come to give you something special that you will be needing soon. Now stretch out your hands, close your eyes. When Obi opened his eyes, he was surprised to see a native chalk on his hands. What does this mean? What am I going to do with this? Obi said. Do not worry, my son. You shall know soon, and when the right time comes, you will use it whenever you feel you are tired or losing strength. You are protected, Obi, my son. You are protected. Two weeks later, the queen felt sorry for Obi and asked her husband, the king, to let him out of the palace cell. King Obina reluctantly agreed, and Obi was set free. One day the king sent Obi to the forest to get some herbs. But Obi got lost while trying to find his way back home. He wandered around the forest for two hours and ended up in another village. This village hated King Obi's kingdom because of land disputes. They didn't want to see anyone from King Obina's village, and if they did, they'd sacrifice them to their gods. As Obi sat tired in the forest, he heard some men talking and walking towards him. He quickly and quietly climbed a tree. When they arrived at the spot where Obi had hidden in the tree, they gathered beneath it and started talking about their wicked plans to attack King Obina's village. They spoke in hushed tones, outlining their strategy to invade under the cover of darkness and wreak havoc on the unsuspecting villagers. Obi listened in shock. After they left, Obi quietly came down from the tree. As he was about to start finding his way back home, then the same voice appeared to him again, saying, Obi, my dear son, don't be afraid, close your eyes. And when Obi opened his eyes, he was shocked to be back in King Obina's village. He was so happy and ran to the king's palace to tell him what he heard. He ran as fast as he could, and when Obi finally got to the palace, he hurried inside, his heart pounding fast. He went straight to the king, looking worried. Your majesty, he said, his voice shaking, we're in big trouble. King Obina, already angered by Obi's tardiness, scolded him harshly. You son of nobody, 
How dare you barge in on me? Who raised you? Please, my king, listen to me. We're in serious trouble, Obi pleaded. But King Obina cut him off, refusing to hear a word. I know your tricks. You think I'll buy it? No, try again. Instantly he ordered his guards to take Obi away and deprived him of food. As the guards moved to obey, the queen intervened. Don't take him away. Let's hear him speak. How dare you disobey my orders, the king thundered. Leave my presence. I am so sorry, your majesty, the queen begged. But please, let's hear from Obi. I think he has something important to tell us. Please, my lord, let's listen to him. After his wife's plea, King Obina finally agreed to listen to Obi. Obi then recounted everything he had heard in the bush to the king and queen. I knew it. These people are so ungrateful. After everything we have done for them, they still want to attack us and take our land. King Obina exclaimed angrily, It won't happen over my dead body. But my king, this is not the right time for this. We have to act fast. The enemies will attack in a few days, the queen urged. Realizing the urgency, King Obina quickly called upon all the warriors in the land and briefed them on Obi's intelligence. Together, they prepared for battle, with the village priest offering blessings and protections. When the rival village attacked, King Obina's warriors, led by Obi, caught them off guard and fought bravely until victory was theirs. They sang in triumph, on their way home, praising Obi for his strength and leadership. As they returned to the village, the villagers, who had already gathered in the village square, anxiously awaiting their return, erupted into screams of excitement at the sight of their victorious warriors. They cheered loudly, overjoyed that their defenders were safe and had triumphed over their enemies. Soon the king's palace was filled with villagers, eager to celebrate the victory. Addressing his people, King Obina said, My people, we thank our gods for this victory and I want to extend my gratitude to Obi for his bravery. Despite how bad I have treated him in the past, he selflessly saved us from our enemies. The king's words filled the air with admiration and respect. From today onward, Obi shall lead our warriors as their head and stand as the second in command of our great kingdom, the king declared, his voice resounding with authority. And if any of you wish to see me, you must first pass through Obi, Obi was stunned by the king's proclamation and humbly thanked him for the honor and trust bestowed upon him. I promise to serve you with all my heart, your royal majesty, he exclaimed, gratitude shining in his eyes. The following day, King Obina approached Obi and asked him how he had come to be abducted and sold to him by the strangers. Obi proceeded to recount the harrowing tale of his abduction, leaving King Obina shocked. That someone, even a blood brother, could commit such abominable act. After listening to Obi's story, the king then asked if Obi wished to return to his own people. Obi paused for a moment, then replied, Not now, my king. I will go back to my people at the right time. King Obina nodded solemnly, understanding Obi's decision. He vowed to support Obi in whatever path he chooses, grateful for the bravery and loyalty he had shown to the kingdom. Back in Obi's village, Chuka had risen to the position of second in command, and the king had entrusted him with half of the village. However, with his newfound power, Chuka began to abuse his authority. He started behaving recklessly, seizing people's land and belongings. Anyone who dared to disobey him faced severe consequences, as he would claim their wives and force them to serve him. When the king heard about Chuka's mischief, he invited him to the palace. Chuka, the king began, his voice serious but calm, I've heard troubling things about your actions. It's important to use your power responsibly and treat others with fairness and kindness. Chuka, feeling defensive and frustrated, listened reluctantly. But your majesty, he protested, I'm only doing what I think is best for the village. The king sighed, understanding Chuka's perspective but also recognizing the harm his actions were causing. Chuka, he replied firmly, you must understand that your actions have consequences. I expect you to respect my authority and the well-being of our people. Despite the king's words, Chuka felt angry and he walked away from the king, still believing he was right. When Chuka returned home, he told his wife, 
Princess Amaka, about how the king scolded him. My husband, don't listen to my father, Princess Amaka reassured him. He's always been like this, thinking he's smart. Don't worry, we'll handle him. Maybe he won't even be around to tell the story. Curious, Chuka asked, What do you mean, my queen? But Princess Amaka simply replied, Don't worry, you'll understand when the time comes. Despite the king's warnings, Chuka persisted in his wrongful behavior, mistreating the villagers and seizing their possessions by force. His actions finally pushed the king to his breaking point. He instructed his guards to bring Chuka to the palace. When they got to Chuka's house, he resisted going with the guards, but they dragged him to the palace anyway. Once there, the king had already gathered the villagers and made a decree. From now on, the king announced, Chuka is no longer second in command. He loses everything I gave him. Not content with stripping Chuka of his titles and privileges, the king even considered taking Princess Amaka from him. However, to everyone's surprise, Princess Amaka refused to be separated from her husband. I will go with my husband, Chuka, she declared firmly. Feeling ashamed and disgraced, Chuka and Princess Amaka left the palace. The villagers laughed at them as they walked away in shame. If you are enjoying this story, please like, share and subscribe to our channel. Don't miss part 3 by turning on post notifications. Your support means everything to us. And let us know you are excited for the next chapter with a comment below.